Let's turn to Genesis. Chapter 1. My favorite chapter for 32 years. God said, verse 26, let us make who? Man in our own image and our likeness. And let them have dominion over the earth. God's talking. God is stuck now. He is stuck with his words. He says, let them have dominion over the earth. Isaiah says in chapter 6, verse 3, Holy, 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 the Lord is holy. That means faithful, faithful, faithful. The Lord is faithful, pure in motive. He has no ulterior motives. God says, let them have dominion of the earth. When God told man to have dominion of the earth, he didn't say let us, he said let them. So he took himself out of the situation and put man in. Man is in charge of the earth, not God. Shocking. What happens down here, God lays at our feet. That's why he makes us responsible for our own future. We are the human beings that dominate the earth. So a human, a human is a spirit and a body. That's who dominates the earth. So therefore, when God spoke that, he said, let them have dominion. He was saying, look, you are the ones who have legal authority on this planet. If anyone wants to dwell here legally and function legally, they would have to have a body. God said that. Now God cannot break his word. He's too holy. So God is now telling the devil in chapter 3 verse 15. He said, look, okay devil, you know what the, uh, the law is, don't you? My law is, the law of God is, only spirits with bodies can live on this earth legally, legally, and dwell here legally. Now when you're illegal, you ain't got no power, you see? You have no authority. So Satan goes to Lucifer, I mean to, 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 to the serpent rather, negotiated for his body and borrowed his body. The serpent gave him his body. God cursed the serpent because of that. But now he has a dirt body because the dirt body came from the snake. So now Lucifer who's a spirit now has a dirt body and now he is functioning on earth in a dirt body that was not designed for a spirit. That's why God cursed the snake's body. Snakes used to crawl up on, on, on hind legs. If you check the, the, uh, the skeleton out, you'll see that there are two legs on a snake that have been actually uh, uh, ingrown. They're, they're still there. God cursed him. And Lucifer goes through the snake, talks to the woman. She's legal. He's, he, is, he is illegally legal because now he has a body. And he beguiles her. She disobeys God. She picks the fruit, takes to her husband. He takes from her. He eats the fruit. They both disobey God. They fell. God's spirit cannot dwell in that unholy condition, impure condition. God's word is not being kept anymore. And so God makes a promise. What's the promise? Christmas is coming, Satan. 315. Christmas is coming, Satan. He said, now Lucifer, paraphrase please, paraphrase. You know I can't come right now because I ain't got no body. <laughs> but the woman that you used is going to provide for me a physical body. And I'm going to come into her physically. I'm going to dwell in her physically with a body. And I am going to have a body that's going to make me legal. And I'm going to use that legal state to crush your head legally and take back the power you stole from them legally and give it back to them legally. I will give them back the authority you stole from them over the earth legally. I got authority in heaven, I never lost that. But now I'm coming to earth, I promise you, because I ain't got no authority on earth at the moment. Got it? You sure? <laughs> That's why when he rose from the dead, he had to make a declaration. All authority now, he said. All. I got, he didn't have it. He didn't have a body. Why? He didn't have it because he was holy. 
He couldn't break in on man without a body. Otherwise, he would break his word. God's holiness caused Christmas. His integrity made it necessary for the virgin to have a child. He needed a body, but he couldn't be born of man, so he needed to work a miracle. He needed a body, but he couldn't be in sin, so he needed a miracle. He needed a body, but he could not be from a husband. And so he told the devil, I promise you, this woman's going to fix you. Matter of fact, I like the words he used about the woman. Look at verse 15, chapter 3. And I will put enmity between you and this woman, and between her seed and your seed. And he shall crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. What I promise. This is Christmas. God says, this woman's going to be your nightmare. The word enmity doesn't mean enemy. It means irreconcilable hostility. There will never be an agreement between you and this woman. What I designed a woman to do, you can never change. I designed her to have a child in a way that the blood of the child never mixes with the mother's blood. And that was the enmity he's referring to. He's saying this woman was designed in such a way that she has been literally designed to carry a baby whose blood does not mix with hers. Now you doctors here, you know that is true. When a woman carries a baby, the baby's blood is completely different from the mother's blood and they never mix because the placenta only rests upon the womb. And God is telling this, this uneducated demon, unemployed cherub, he says, look, one thing you didn't know is that when I was designing the woman, I was thinking about myself. And I was making preparations just in case this went wrong like this. And I already made it all, matter of fact, that seed, the, the seed is already dead. <laughs> you talk about plan and preparation. For he was slain when? Before the foundation of the world. So he says he's already dead. Now he needs a body to die in. <laughs> God says, I didn't want the fall, but just in case, I've already prepared. So the son is already dead, waiting to die. But he needs a body because spirits cannot die, so he needs something that can die. And I'm telling you, friends, this is the reason why God became man. Because he had to keep his word. He could not come into this planet without a body. He would have violated his own promise. The second reason why God became man is because he's just. And this is very critical. He is just. What does that mean? Deuteronomy 1.17 says, Judgment belongs to the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 28 says, For the Lord loves justice. Psalm 9 verse 16, The Lord is known by his justice. This is revelation to me, so I've got to ease this on you. <laughs> this is awesome. God, <laughs> can you understand God? God is holy. He doesn't have it. He is the stuff. So God has, God is integrity. He cannot lie. Ooh, glory. Now you understand why. Because he is one. God can never tell you something means something else. He cannot lie. He is holiness. Oh, listen. Because he's holy, whatever he says, he has to make sure it's done. Follow me, please. Don't miss this. So God creates man. God takes the man, put him in the garden, and then God starts talking. Oh. And God says, work, cultivate, replenish, protect, subdue. Oh dear, here it comes. And then God said, obey my command. Don't eat from that tree. Oh my God, stalky. The day you eat, oh no, you will surely die. There it is. Now God's stuck with this promise. You know, death is a promise. Yeah. 
this is awesome. God says, look, if you disobey me, you will surely die. Death will come if you disobey me. This is my word on you. No, this is my word to myself. Oh, we're going to get you in a minute, Pastor. See, God was telling this, this people, he said, look, if you break this word, I promise myself to kill you. You have to die if you break this word. And that's a promise to me, God. Guess what? The man breaks the word. Now God has to be holy still. So God says, hey, I got a problem here. I have to make sure he dies. Oh, Lord, some of y'all feeling it. I see it now. Because if, if he doesn't die, I'm a liar. And let God be true. Because he must be faithful to himself. So God says, I have to kill you to make sure I am still God. Y'all better hang on for Christmas. Thank God for Christmas. I'm telling you, when you understand the integrity of God, God has to be just. See, judgment is a manifestation of God's holiness. Write that down. Whatever you sow, you reap. That's not because God don't like you. That's because God is holy. If you sow evil, God has to make sure that you reap evil unless, unless, Somehow, he'll reap it for you. You're getting it. Okay, watch this. See? <laughs> yeah, you get it too. All right. See, death is God's dealing. God said death. The devil never said he can kill anybody. Are you all listening to me? The devil ain't nothing to do with this. The devil said, look, man, don't blame me. I get killed myself. <laughs> I was kicked out. That's death to the devil. He says, God is the one who told you. He promised himself that you will die. He promised himself that you will die. Get it right, Pat. He promised himself. He didn't promise you even, he, what God says, he says to himself. Yes. Which means if he told you that you're going to die, and he don't want you to die, then somebody got to die. Come on, somebody. Because you can't go without the death, otherwise God would be a liar. He would not be true. He would not be holy. So God has to either kill you or kill somebody else. Yes, yes, yes. You got it? Yeah. All right. So when you read Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy, I ain't got time. Isaiah said, you still ain't going to believe this, what I read. He said, he said, the Lord told me <laughs> the chastisement of your peace was upon this same baby. And then he says, and the iniquities of them all was put upon this one baby. And then he says, and God slew him. Who killed him? God. Oh, now this is deep. God had to kill himself to make sure you don't get killed. You better thank God for Christmas. When I understood this, I fell in love with God just a little bit more this week. I said, Lord, I love you. Oh, I love you. Because if he did not become a man, you would have to die. Go to hell. And it pleased the Lord to kill him, it says. Let 
me tell you why this is important. There are people who you witness to. People from the Baha'i faith. People from the universalism. People from, you know, uh, Buddhism. They say, well, you know, uh, why do you Christians believe in this gory, bloody, uh, uh, you know, murderous religion? You People killing people. You, I mean, why, what kind of God is that would kill people? I mean, you know, in my religion, you know, we got a nice prophet who just have good quotes and good writings and, you know, no, no, why are you going to kill people? I mean, what kind of God got to kill his own son, they say? That's because they don't understand God's nature, his holy, and his purpose. He will not violate the human realm. And so he has to become a man and he is just. His judgment has to be fulfilled. Is anybody clear on this? Yes. God's judgment must be carried out. And God's judgment is also equal to His holiness. What is judgment? Judgment is the result of an action. Do you know that when you, <laughs> when you get blessed, that's judgment? Come on, let's stop before we go. Come on. <laughs> if you give, he says, you shall receive. Okay, so when you give, he judges you. You get blessed. So that's the judgment from the action. That's why it's called justice. When you give somebody justice, you're giving them their rights. I have a right to be blessed if I give. Why? He promised, you promised that. So if you don't bless me after I give, you better check your promises. Y'all better talk to me. So, I guess what I'm saying is, judgment is not negative. Judgment is the nature of God. He has to keep His word. So for God to deal with the fall of man, He has to kill somebody. No, let me be nice to y'all. Somebody has to die. <laughs> Anybody with me? Now, the third one is because God loves us. Now, because in love. Because God... Oh, Lord. This is the last point, you know. Just hang on to this last point. Because God is love. God doesn't have love. He is the stuff. So because God is love, He has to do what He says. Love never fails. I cannot fail in killing you. If I promise you, I can kill you if you disobey me. I have to love you to the death. This is too deep for some of you. I know it's, it's, see? <laughs> so now God, God has a, a decision to make. He made it long before it came up though. He was slain before the, yes, sir. Before the yes. problem even came up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then he made arrangements for the woman's womb in case he needs to put on this flesh. And, and then when it happened, he made the promise, I'm, I'm, I am coming. Let me tell you, the most important event in human history is not the resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> it's the virgin birth that is why they attack that the most dog. because if God came in the flesh if he got into the human race everything else is okay for us it's okay I thank God that he made it he came into human flesh because if he came in human flesh he could die then if he died he could be resurrected see you can't resurrect till you die so the resurrection was dependent upon the conception. Uh, the death was dependent upon the conception because spirits cannot die. And, oh, oh, stay with me just a second. See, <laughs> death, thank you sir, death has to occur. There are two deaths. There is spiritual death and there is the physical death. Now, in order for God's word to be faithful, he has to have both. 
And instead of, he says, I love my children. I don't want them to die. Even though I promise that if anyone breaks this word, they're going to die. So what I'm going to do is instead of them dying, I'm going to die in their place. Merry Christmas, everybody. I am going to die. Now, they die twice. They die spiritually. Are you all listening to me? This is a deep one. That means when you disobey God in the garden, God, oh boy, this thing will come out too good. Lord, help me. God forsook man. The Holy Spirit left. That's why we died the very day we ate. The Bible says, the day you eat, dead. But man lived 930 years after that, physically. Which means the day Adam sinned, he was dead. What was that? God forsook him. He couldn't be with him anymore. For, and for all these thousands of years, man has been without God in the world. But then he died physically also. So in order for God now to be just, his judgment has to be perfect. That's why the Bible all through keeps saying the judgments of the Lord are true and they are righteous all together. The judgments of God are pure. In other words, when he judges, he makes it full. He does it a complete job. When God judges us, God says, I got to kill them. The wages of sin is death. So if you are a sinner, you must die twice. You die spiritually, God forsakes you, and you die physically, you go in the grave. He says, now, if I'm going to substitute for them, first I got to get into a body. Thank God for Christmas. Yes. Then I got to die spiritually. Not only with me to die spiritually for them, is that I got to forsake myself, even if it's briefly. The only way for God to forsake himself is for sin to be present. And so on the cross, Isaiah said, the iniquities of us all, nine, six thousand, I mean six billion people's sins, plus the other nine billion in the, in the grave. All. Every sin you commit, every sin you planning to commit, and the one you don't know about yet, all of them was put on this baby. One man, all iniquities were placed upon him. And the Bible says, and he was taken from among the living. What was Jesus' greatest cry on the cross? You know, he, he didn't cry for too many things, you know. But there was one big cry that made him grunt like a lion. And that was the cry of that moment when the father had to forsake himself. You think God loves you? You don't know how much God loves you. Yes. Yes. The Bible says, and he cried out, Father! Father, why? In other words, he felt the loneliness. God loved you so much. He did two things you'll never understand on this side of glory. One, you'll never understand what God felt to be apart from himself. And that was because of you. You think God don't love you. God left himself for you. And here's the word. The word has always been with the Father. He said, my God, why? The question was a good question. Why hast thou, not are you planning to, but you did it. Why hast thou forsaken me? That was, that was Genesis 3 taking place in the Godhead. And 
The second thing he did, we'll never understand, is that when he became man, he knew that he could never be the way he was before, ever. He would always have to be man. As a sacrifice, you will never understand. The Bible says even today, today, there's one mediator between God and man, and it ain't a spirit. How do you deal with that? You know what you cause? You cause God to be stuck in the body forever. Don't you ever take lightly the salvation of God. You cause God to ever be separated from himself forever. Forever. He make an intercession for you. The man Christ Jesus. He is forever stuck in a body because of your fall. How dare we walk around just doing what we feel like. When we feel like. Casually coming in even to worship. When you don't know the price. The cost. So we find John. That's a deep fella. He got the revelation of it. John says, the word was made flesh. Dwelt among us. And I saw God. And three chapters over, John broke out and couldn't handle it. John says, for God so loved. Hallelujah. Come on, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in this guy shall not perish but have everlasting life. Close your Bible. His love will never leave us. There was a law that every city where there were a certain amount of Jews, at a figure, I think it may have been about 500 or so, wherever there were at least 500 Jews settled, there had to be a synagogue. So the synagogue was the place that indicated that the city was a center of Jewish religious activity. The only synagogue they found in the entire northern area, there's none in Nazareth because it wasn't large enough. The only synagogue they found, and we visited that synagogue, uh, those who've been to Israel with me, is found in Capernaum. Small synagogue. Now this synagogue is important because when you go to Israel and you visit that synagogue, you are visiting the synagogue of Yeshua or the one that Jesus attended. It had to be his local church. That's why it's important to read Luke 4 because he, he goes to the desert for 40 days, he comes back, he's ready to start his ministry and he goes directly to the synagogue. Why? The synagogue was not just a place of religious worship. It was also a community center. Can you write that down please? Because sometimes in our Western religion, uh, mental Understanding, we think that the synagogue was just a church building or a worship building. No, it was a, a meeting place for the community. As a matter of fact, the word shin, agog, means place of meeting. So the synagogue was where the people went to get the news for the day because they didn't have any newspapers, they didn't have any radio or television. So if you want to know what's going on every week, you wanted to go to, to the synagogue every Shabbat not just to worship, but to get information about the community activities. So the synagogue was always filled with people on the weekends. Saturdays was the day of their worship time and their community activities. Everybody went to the synagogue. So Jesus going to the synagogue, you would almost wonder why he always went to the synagogue where there was always trouble for him. Because that was the place, it was like going to the local radio station. Or going to the TV. If you want your, your news to get out, you go to the place where everybody meets. Is that clear? So even when they pushed him out of it, he still went back the next week because that's where everybody was. And he wanted them to get what? His message. So he went to the synagogue the first day of his ministry. Let's read what happens here in Luke 4. It says, verse 14, Jesus returned to the Galilee. The Galilee means that that area. It means the whole area. Galilee, in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their what? 
Very important. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. How come? Because everybody showed up there. So he taught. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue and as was his custom. Now that whole area there, the synagogue served. And he stood up as was his custom and he stood up and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written and he read. Now, by the way, why would they give him the scroll? Remember that a Jewish boy became a man at age 12. So he went to the synagogue, remember at age 12, and he went through the process of his bar mitzvah, we would call it, and he passed the test. Matter of fact, he passed the test so well that even the teachers couldn't answer his questions. Then he went back home, and now he's 30 years old, and at 30 years old, he went directly to John the Baptist to be baptized, to submit to authority, to stay under a pastor so he can get his ministry legitimately started. John baptized him, the Holy Spirit confirms him, he goes back into the desert, he's tested, he's 30 years old, now he comes out ready to begin his assignment, his ministry to the world. That's Jesus. So he comes in, now, at 30 years old, any man who attends the synagogue at 30 years old could read the scriptures. He's now qualified to read the scripture. So once a man is 30 years old, he is qualified to be a rabbi and to read the scripture. So now Jesus qualifies. Jesus is smart, eh? He couldn't start his ministry at 16 because they wouldn't let him read. God's smart, huh? The culture says you couldn't read until you were 30. So at 30 years old, he began his ministry, went to the synagogue and sat down. Now, people had already talked about him because where did he perform his first miracle? In Canaan. Where's Canaan? Canaan is about three miles away from Nazareth. So that miracle got around. So everybody was talking about this guy. So here he is. He comes back to town. He's been away for a few, uh, a few weeks. And he sits in the synagogue. And they were, of course, impressed. He had not yet caused any trouble. So they thought, wow, um, Mary's boy is in town today. Let's let him read the scriptures. Shouldn't have done that. Why? According to the eternal clock, it's time to begin his ministry. So they turned the, the Bible. The Bible is a scroll. That's the scroll of the Old Testament prophets. And Isaiah was the one they gave him. That was the reading for the day. What a day for him to show up in the synagogue. Now, this is important. Because every synagogue Sabbath, there was a certain scripture that had to be read based on the time of the year in the calendar. Anybody go with this? Could you imagine him showing up on the same day when they were reading from the same book where it was introducing the Messiah to the world? God is too awesome. So he sits in the service on the day that he's supposed to be introduced and they gave him the book of the introduction of the Messiah. And he, the Bible says, look at it, it says, he opens to the place where these words are written. And then he starts to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to give recovery of sight to the blind to release the oppressed keep reading and to proclaim the year of jubilee king james Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, the acceptable year of the Lord. Anybody got those terms? Now, those of you who depend on the, which Bible you have, it has all three words, doesn't it? It has the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee, or the acceptable year. Now, what is he talking about? First of all, let me just paint a picture of the concept here. Oh, by the way, it may be helpful to read verse 20. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was upon him. And he began by saying to them, Today, 
this scripture <laughs> is fulfilled right before your eyes. Now that's heavy. And that's also difficult. <laughs> I found it ironic that he sat down before he said it. And by the way, why do you think, I mean, of course, rabbis read scriptures every weekend in the synagogue so that they were used to people reading scriptures. Why do you think they would all stop the service and just look at him? I want you to think about this. Now remember, he's in this synagogue, it's filled with men. On the other side between the grill is the women. They're separate. He reads and he sits down. Well, everyone reads every weekend and sits down. It's no big deal. So they don't look at the guy who read. Why stop the service? Everyone's quiet and they just look at him. I believe it's because it's the way he read it. See, we just read scripture. <laughs> you know, it's kind of tough for you to read the scriptures and they're not yours. <laughs> you know, when you read my books, you got to kind of think about what I'm saying. But when I read my books, I am saying what I'm saying. The author stood up and read the book. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? And the author is now reading it, not in the third person, second person. He's now reading it in what? The first person. He's saying, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He didn't say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. No. See, we read it that way. <laughs> the way he read it. I think the priest sitting there went, he's saying it as if the me is him. That's why they were quiet. They never heard anyone read scriptures as if it was talking about them. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I think he probably put action in it. And they went, what is this? And so since they didn't believe what he said, <laughs> you can know why. I mean, they, they didn't believe it. They said, you can't believe what he just did. He said, let me explain to you. That is happening now. You are witnessing the fulfillment of what you've been reading for a thousand years. Now, what did he say about himself? This is important to Jubilee. First of all, he says, I have come and I've been anointed to what? Preach. What's number one? Preach. Preach the gospel to who? The poor. So the poor people don't need money, according to Jesus. They need information. <laughs> and that's important. Poor people need what? The gospel. Now, by the way, let me just touch on this. If Jesus said that he was sent to preach the gospel to the poor, then don't you think God knows what the poor needs? Yes. And what does he say the poor need? The gospel. Yes. This is important. So, does it mean then that, that the answer to poverty is not money? But it's what? The gospel. Which means that any gospel that doesn't make a poor man rich is not the true gospel so any gospel that tells you that poverty is holiness must not be the true you're a little quiet on me tell your neighbor he's talking sense I mean look at the Bible you're gonna argue with me look at the Bible he says I came to preach the gospel to the poor so if you're poor Somehow, if you get the gospel, it changes your conditions and your situation. If you really understand the gospel, that means the good news of the kingdom, and you apply it, it should change your situation. I came to preach the gospel to the poor. What else? Number two. What is number two? To proclaim freedom to the prisoners. That has to do with those who are imprisoned 
by sin, satanic oppression, to proclaim freedom. Thirdly, to do what? To give sight back to the blind. He's not talking about physical blindness here. He's referring to revelation knowledge. He's referring to people's eyes being opened by the light of the knowledge of God. Then, fourthly, what's the next one? To release the oppressed. That means sickness and disease and infirmities are also to be destroyed by the power of Jesus. So he came to deliver you mentally, socially, and physically. What a powerful job he has. And then spiritually to set you free from the prison of sin. So every area of life he came to deliver you from. Now, so keep reading. Watch this. But the last assignment he has is a prophetic one. Look at the words he used. He says, and to what? Proclaim. Some translation says to declare. The word proclaim means to announce. They can make some notes right here. The last assignment of Jesus is listed here. Okay. First assignment is what? Preach the gospel to the poor. Did he do that? Yes, he did. Second assignment. Did he set the captives free from sin? Yes, he did. He died to set us free from sin. Thirdly, did he open our eyes and see the truth? Yes, he did that. He taught the truth that opened our eyes because by truth we are set free. Fourthly, did he set us free from infirmities and provide healing for our bodies? Yes, to set the captives free and the oppressed go free. He did that. But this last part, he didn't do. He said he only will announce it. You're going to stay with me here now. He said when it comes to this, this thing called the year of jubilee, the year of God's favor, the year of God's acceptance, he says, I'm going to announce that. I'm not going to initiate it. Interesting. Only the wise will get me here. Everything on my assignment, I'm going to do except this one. This one, I'll only say, is coming. Hallelujah. Some of you are going to get it. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to release the oppressed. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to open their eyes. But this last assignment, I'll only announce that it's coming. Why? Because it couldn't be initiated in his day. Why? Because Jesus lived in the fifth and sixth day. All right, let me prove it. Let's get to the days. Uh, we mentioned, are you understanding what I'm saying? This is so critical. Jesus did not initiate Jubilee. He just said, it's coming. While he was on earth, he talked about 2001. You are the generation, no, we are the generation <laughs> that are blessed to be alive to enter what Jesus promised would come. And that is the year, everybody say the year, yeah. of what? Jubilee. Now, let's read it again. Read this verse again. It's very important. He says, and to proclaim, to declare, what? The year of God's jubilee. God's favor. The what? Say it loud. The year. Why? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. This is so wonderful. How many covenants have God cut in the Old Testament? Dozens. How many ordinances have God instituted in the Old Testament? Hundreds. Follow me. <laughs> but this co 
covenant, out of all the covenants, God pulled out and said, when I come to earth, this one I'm going to make sure happens. Jubilee, among all the covenants, is the one Jesus said he came to tell you will come. All kind of covenants in the, in the Old Testament. But Jesus pulls out this one. He said this one is a New Testament covenant. This is a, a futuristic covenant. This is a covenant for the generations who will come after my day. Oh, please. Get this. Okay, turn to Psalm 91. Everybody say the year of the Lord. Say it again. Sorry, Psalm 90, Psalm 90. Everybody turn there. Get your pen. I want you to underline these words, okay? Now, what does he say he came to proclaim? The year of the Lord's favor. The word there is jubilee or the acceptable year of the Lord. What does he call it? A year. Now, this is interesting because when you read the Bible, remember God is consistent. God never contradicts himself. That's why he's holy. He's one with himself. Let's read what he says here in Psalm 90, uh, verse 4. Out loud, together, go. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. <laughs> Wow. Uh, verse 9. All of our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or even 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. Verse 12. Teach me to number my days and to do it correctly. This is in the Bible. God says, look, don't just live days. Number them. Understand them. Understand time. And understand it correctly. Why? Wasn't it Jesus who said to the Pharisees and scribes, he said, they did not know their day of visitation. They didn't understand God's purpose and plan for their lives. They missed their day of visitation. It's possible for you to sit down in the year 2001 and not know what it is. That's why God sends prophetic words and prophetic voices like myself and millions like us who come into your life and say, look, do you know what time it is? Number your days. And he says, a day is like what? A thousand years. Now, this is important. Because when you go back to the year of God's favor or the year of God's jubilee, go back, if you will, to the book of Leviticus, you find out that this year of God's favor was a year of tremendous advantage. And Jesus said he came to proclaim that that year would come. How long is a day? A thousand years. It's interesting. A day is a thousand years. Uh, get your pen and write these down again, please. I'll give you a little bit of a history here. From Adam to Abraham is 1,000 years. From Adam to Abraham is 1,000 years. Write that down. From Abraham to Moses is 1,000 years. From Moses to David... It's 1,000 years. From David to Jesus is 1,000 years. How many days gone by? Four days. Okay. From Jesus to last December. Can we get any more up to date than that? From Jesus 
to last December 31st is all in a fresh baked waffle bowl. Well, I was shopping for a new car. Which one's me? A cool convertible or an SUV? Too bad I didn't know my credit was whack. Sevens. And everything God does in sevens, he does it the same way, the same way so that you can predict God. The first day of God's week, he always creates things. Second day, he refines them. Third day, he puts them in order. The fourth day, he begins to distinguish their assignments, their purposes. The fifth day of God, he's always producing reproduction. He makes things reproduce. On the sixth day, God always gives his best. Okay. If you read the Bible and you study the seven days of creation, you'll discover some interesting things. One of them is that on the sixth day, write that word sixth day down, sixth day, God created man. So six is the number of man. Write that down. Anything that What's more, Billy is remarkably adept at slipping. Now, when did God create man? On the sixth day. That's God's ultimate creation on earth was man, because man is the apex of his creation. Now what happens to man? Man, the project fell apart. Why? Because the man sinned, he disobeyed God. So God's highest project fell apart. Man rebelled and God lost his project. What did God do? God made a promise. On the same day the man was lost, he said, the woman shall carry a seed. Oh! Yes, today, I have come to preach the good news to the poor, to set at liberty those that are in prison, to remove the shackles of Sometimes God tell you turn to this corner, you better turn. <laughs> I remember one time I got an accident that way. Some told me don't go this way this morning and I went and I got hit. My car. God knows where he wants you located. So the woman took the baby against the law and placed him in the bush. And his sister Miriam was supposed to watch him until the edict was over and the killing was finished. That was the program. That was their idea. But God's idea was he got to get this boy in the castle. Because this kid got to learn the alphabet. He got to go to school. He got to learn to read and write. Why? Because one day I got to tell him, write. By the way, that's why you need to go to school, young people. God loves education. God want to use you, but if you can't communicate and document and articulate, then God, God will use you, but not as effectively as he could. And so Moses was hidden in this basket. Here comes the, the prince, the, the daughter, the princess. She's, she hears the baby crying. She goes, checks it out, doesn't know what the baby is or who it belongs to. And she decides that she likes the baby. You know, God will make an enemy like you. <laughs> Everybody say favor. Yeah. There are people in the bank who got to give you things this year and they don't like you. And God caused her to have favor toward this boy. Miriam stepped out of the bush and says, uh, Ma'am, uh, I'd be happy to serve as your nanny, your nurse for the baby. She doesn't know that this is Moses' sister. And so the princess says, fine. So she takes the baby home and takes Miriam with her and introduces the baby to her father. And her father, of course, God caused him to have favor with this baby. What is God doing? Preparing for education. And it says that Pharaoh adopted the boy as his own. Wow. By the way, let me just say this, and this has been on my mind the other day. There's some of you who've been trying to have children. This has been on my mind strongly the other day. And I want to tell you as a pastor, 
that if you have been attempting and trying to have children as a married couple and nothing's been productive at the moment, please do not hesitate to consider adoption. Because God used Pharaoh and an adopted baby to change the world. Being a parent is, is not the same as being a mother, a biological mother and father. Do you know that, listen carefully, I'm going to say something very heavy. Do you know that Moses' mother and father could not prepare him for the ministry? I believe there's a baby somewhere in hospital who is not wanted by their parents. Because their parents, God knows, cannot prepare them for their vision. And maybe you need to adopt that child. Moses' mother and father could not read nor write. And God needed a man who could write the first five books of the Bible. And the Ten Commandments. And the laws of God. And the hygiene laws. And the, the constitutional laws that we use in our governments today were written by a man who was educated by an adopted parent. And Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh, the Bible says. And here's what it says about what Moses says. And he was wise in the, in, the, in, the, in the ways of the Egyptians. What does that mean? He was educated. The Bible says he also attended the schools of the Egyptians. And became, listen to the words, well learned in the ways of the Egyptians. That means Moses, obviously if you're Pharaoh's son, you're going to get not just education. You're going to get what? The best education. So Moses, look how God set this guy up. He is a Hebrew. He is the enemy. Everybody say favor. favor. Don't you feel it coming on you? This year, some things are going to happen to you that way. Matter of fact, you're going to be blessed in conditions where it makes no sense to you nor the person who blessing you. Anybody want to receive that kind of blessing? It ain't going to make no sense. And here's Pharaoh educating his destroyer. You know, I like what the Bible says. The Bible says, all of those who have dug pits for you shall fall in them themselves. Can I hear an amen? There are some people who are planning your destruction. This is the year for you to laugh. Relax on the job, in your business, in the business where people are doing stuff to try and work against you. Don't, 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 don't worry about this thing. Tell your neighbor, I'm a set up baby. Now say it like you believe it. I'm a set up baby. I mean, I'm so designed for success that even my enemy feeds me. Kona mashita rabasata. I mean, I'm so, I'm so wired to succeed that my enemy supports me. I believe some of you are working for people whose job you're going to take. Don't be afraid of that. That's good. There are people who you work for who you're going to have to become the leader of. 